colleagues, I suggest that we resume our work and we are working at a most interesting, most information intensive conference focusing on uh, social rights and their protection by administrative courts. And in this very session, we will focus on uh, certain universal issues relating to the administrative judiciary. We will be speaking about procedural remedies um, uh, in social disputes, uh, but when it comes to effectiveness, and uh, we will remember that the uh, that Article 2 of uh, the Ukrainian Code of Administrative Procedure um, sets that the aim of the administrative justice is to ensure the effective protection of our human rights. So we will be speaking now about the effectiveness. There are uh, various uh, ways to ensure this effectiveness, and we will focus on uh, the most practical tools. We will be speaking about the uh, consistency and uniformity of case law, and um, I'm glad that uh, the Social Chamber and the Grand Chamber of the entire Supreme Court has worked very intensively to introduce the new institution and the new notion of the pilot case. We will be speaking about the the uh, uh, strategic ways of uh, protecting uh, social rights and administrative uh, justice. We will be discussing some universal, but not uh, so popular tools as a separate determination uh, and some or special determination and some other aspects of effectiveness. We are very pressed for time. Please remember about that. And I will be uh, actually asking you to uh, do your best to keep within the time limits, um, seven to ten minutes. I, you can save time um, not us, uh, thanking the organizers. We all understand that uh, all of the speakers are thankful to the organizers for the invitation. And I hope that Ms. Eva Wendler uh, hears as well. Okay, good afternoon and warm greetings to you all from the south of Austria. Uh, as we all noticed, we are behind schedule and there I'm going right into the topic. Uh, social rights cover a wide range of issues of citizens and the determination of social rights are mainly in the hand of uh, administrative authorities. Therefore, administrative, co administrative courts play a crucial role in social rights enforcement. Nevertheless, there are social rights which cannot be reviewed by administrative courts in Austria. These are, for example, issues concerning support fundings. Um, a disabled person, for example, who uh, uses a wheelchair and his or her apartment uh, must be adapted. This person can apply for a construction cost subsidy. But in the case the authority does not grant the subsidy or grants less than requested, uh, there is no appeal possible. The reason for this is that subsidies are granted in the framework of non-sovereign administration. That mean, means in these cases the state acts as a private individual and the state cannot be forced to sign a contract granting a subsidy. Therefore, a lack of uh, legal protection is to be stated in this area of social rights. Uh, the federal, co federal administrative court um, is the court where I work. It's a court of first instance. We are mainly dealing with asylum cases, but also with social cases. Uh, with regard to yes, social yes. cases, we have to deal with, um, for example, disability law, and here particularly uh, casing, cases concerning protection against dismissal and the degree of disability. Focusing on procedural means for social rights enforcement before administrative courts, 
I would like to stress that disability law cases are decided by a panel of judges. In cases concerning the degree of disability, a three judges panel adjudicates. The panel consists of two professional judges. One of these judges is the presiding judge and the pre presiding judge carries out the preparatory works. The third member of the judge uh, of the jury is a lay judge. Lay judges in social jurisdiction are providing their special expertise. They are in particular competent to understand the conflicts behind the cases. Therefore, the participation of lay judges fosters increased acceptance on the complainant side. Lay judges are nominated by disab disabled people's organizations. They are appointed for a period of six years and on the basis of the established distribution of the court business, the lay judge is assigned to a certain panel. In general, an oral public hearing must be held according to the uh, general procedural administrative law and according to the jurisprudence of the Supreme Court. There are only some few exceptions. In case an oral hearing is not held, there must be a justification referring to this topic in the final ruling. Also from my personal point of view, the oral hearing is an essential part in the decision-making process. The right to an oral hearing means in essence that a person is provided an opportunity to present his or her case orally before the court. An oral hearing is particularly important in cases where the court deals not only with matters of law, but with the assessment of facts. Administrative courts of first instance have to give a judgment on the substance of the case. Therefore, in preparation of the hearing and in the hearing itself, the evidence required must be taken. In the oral hearing, the lay judge has the right to speak and to ask questions. In the decision-making process, the lay judge has a vote in the panel. The decision does not have to be unanimous. Simply majority is sufficient. This can lead to the situation that the presiding judge can be overruled. Nevertheless, the presiding judge has to give the reason for the decision. The consultation of the judges are secret and it is not announced that there has been a dissenting opinion. Another important issue in social proceedings um, is the participation of medical experts. Most of, our, of us judges have no more medical experience than the average intelligent layperson. For this reason, we heavily rely on expert opinions. An expert can provide background information, explain scientific pr principles, and build contextual understanding for judges. Uh, in practical, uh, that means uh, before the oral hearing starts, the medical experts, ex uh, they have to consult the case, um, the, cases, the case documents, in particular the doctor, doctor's letters, which were submitted by the complainant. Then the complainant is medically checked by the doctor in the doctor's office. And then the doctor delivers um, a written expert opinion. In many proceedings, the medical expert participates in the oral hearing. Um, then the expert is interviewed by the judges and the expert has the right to ask the complainant. And then he or she supplements and concretizes his or her written opinion. So for us, the direct taking of evidence is of utmost importance in the decision-making progress. Uh, another benchmark to be discussed for a state governed by law is the access to justice. Uh, I know that there is only little time left and I just want to um, stress in brief some crucial points. In, so, uh, 
in general, there is no obligation to be uh, presented by a lawyer uh, before the uh, administrative courts of first instance. In case of self-presentation, self the judge has the duty to explain the possible procedural steps and their consequences to the complainant. The complainant can also be presented by a disabled people's organization if the organization is a legal entity. There are no court fees in social cases. The time period to lodge an appeal is quite long. It's four weeks and the complaint don't have to be very detailed. It can, the text can be written in simple language. These procedural means should guarantee an effective access to justice. So please allow me to conclude my remarks here. Thank you for your attention and your interest. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mrs. Ever. Thank you. That's uh, participation of medical experts are very, is very interesting for us. That's an element of as medical examination is very important for us. It's my pleasure to see that Vladislav Knyazev appears uh, in, on the display. And Mr. Sevalund, I welcome you. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you very well. Um, my greetings to all of the participants and dear colleagues. And I would like to thank all of the speakers uh, today for uh, your high appreciation of uh, the practices of uh, and and case law of the Grand Chamber, uh, and for your um, wishes that you vented during the day. Uh, we also are very receptive and open to all of your critical remarks, and we will take them on board to improve uh, the way we work to make it even more efficient and effective. Thank you very much for your um, uh, for your um, responses. Uh, now to my uh, topic. It's about the um, uh, pilot cases that we consider uh, in uh, Grand Chamber in uh, the area of pensions. Uh, today, uh, the um, pilot cases and pilot proceedings have been already mentioned. It's a new um, provision for the Ukrainian legislation and it was highly praised uh, in, by Ukrainian domestic courts, particularly of the first instance, uh, and international uh, judicial community. And I think that was a breakthrough in our um, uh, country. And you will know that uh, Cassation Court serves here as the first instance court, and the Grand Chamber works as a Cassation instance. Just by and large, over the uh, years of um, uh, its activities, the Grand Chamber considered 11 um, uh, pilot proceedings uh, in what concerns the protection of right to pension um, by uh, 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 different categories of uh, pension pensioners or retired people. First of all, about the military personnel, uh, military retirees. It was about uh, the uh, recalculation of the amount of uh, the pensions that include uh, different benefits and different surcharges, etc., cetera, um, so that the overall amount could be revised. Then we also looked into cases about the pensions to IDP, uh, and uh, you've heard some comments uh, there on. Then uh, pensions to um, retirees who do not work and uh, live in um, contaminated, radioactively cont contaminated areas. Then um, uh, particularly uh, the Chernobyl accident uh, survivors uh, on uh, the money and on uh, certain additional medical uh, benefits. And then uh, pensions to um, law enforcement retirees and prose uh, prosecutorial retirees, and, uh, in particular for the recalculation of uh, the amount of their pensions, or uh, say uh, just uh, different categories of pensions and uh, monthly uh, payments uh, to uh, judges emeritus. 
Now, uh, when it comes to the pension provision to uh, the military uh, retirees, uh, it is about the uh, ruling of the Grand Chamber of 2016 about uh, the uh, deeming unlawful the decision of the pension fund to reduce the uh, basic amount of their pension and requiring that it should be revised. Uh, the Grand Chamber agreed with the decisions of the first instant court um, and the uh, first instance and uh, uh, court and court of appeal uh, decided that there were no ground for uh, the uh, recalculation according to law, uh, article uh, 64 of uh, the relevant uh, 1992 law and a resolution of the cabinet of ministers of 1992. So as we said, there were no ground uh, to uh, satisfy this claim. Uh, that is to recalculate, uh, recalculate this uh, pension because it applies to the newly appointed pensions. So the, the uh, amount uh, um, of uh, the pension is uh, subject to this new legislation, whereas the percentage or the uh, ratio of the pension as regards the uh, previous uh, salary uh, does not apply. Then I would like to draw your attention to the ruling of the Grand Chamber of 2020 about uh, the decision of the Pension uh, Fund of Ukraine on recalculation and payment of uh, pension from 2018. And uh, the Grand Chamber agreed with the uh, opinion of the Cassation Court, whereby uh, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, revoking of uh, the relevant um, provisions in the Cabinet of Ministers resolution d uh, does not uh, affect uh, the, uh, the calculation of the pensions. On uh, the military, uh, uh, regarding military uh, retirees, and it did not change because of the new uh, resolution. And the, um, the, uh, the respondent had to check the correctness of the certificates that were submitted, but uh, they do not have to actually uh, recalculate the pensions. Then uh, uh, judgment of 2020 uh, on the complaint of uh, the former uh, military servicemen about the change of the amount of the pension. Uh, so, and the Grand Chamber also supported the conclusion of the opinion of Cassation Administrative Court and uh, did not reverse it. Uh, just then the, uh, the uh, decision of the first uh, instance court was deemed correct. According to that uh, decision, the pension uh, was to be increased twofold because uh, the decision of uh, the, the resolution of the cabinet of ministers that um, uh, forbids to do so was uh, repealed next slide please in uh, our ruling in Case 160, uh, the ruling of the Grand Chamber was uh, announced in uh, 2020. Uh, just uh, that was again uh, the case against uh, the um, Social Protection Authority uh, because they. Uh, Uh, it was about uh, the change of uh, the amount of uh, the pension and uh, the Grand Chamber agreed with the Cassation Court uh, whereby the, uh, the claim was satisfied because uh, starting on the 5th of um, March 2019, the decision of the uh, uh, admin district, administrative district uh, court uh, in the city of Kiev uh, took effect and it deemed um, unlawful some of the norms of resolution 103. 
uh, with regard to the uh, monetary uh, allowance to the active military servicemen. So there were grounds uh, for the recalculation of uh, the pension based on their uh, salaries, based on their uh, their uh, service record um, amount and uh, some additional fees and uh, uh, surcharge. In uh, the ruling of uh, 2018 on uh, pensions to the IDPs, the Grand Chamber uh, protected the right to pension of IDPs, and the subject uh, or the object of consideration was uh, the claim of uh, or the complaint of an IDP. Uh, who uh, used to receive pensions according to uh, the law of uh, 1950, and it was about uh, the uh, cessation uh, by the pension uh, fund uh, authority or body uh, to uh, stop uh, paying such pensions, and uh, the um, Grand Chamber uh, ruled uh, that uh, this um, uh, pension should be renewed. Uh, or, and we said that uh, when the uh, payment of such pension was suspended ungroundedly, uh, that the pension fund violated the right, the pension right of the, um, of the uh, complainant, uh, and that right is uh, protected under Article 1, Protocol 1 uh, to uh, EC. HR. So that decision was not um, based on, on law. Another interesting uh, pilot case was about in radiologically contaminated areas. It is interested in that the Constitutional Court uh, actually uh, made several uh, rulings to this effect and there was a legal uh, conflict uh, where, uh, whereby there was a non-constitutional norm of the law, but then the Parliament amended that law uh, with the same uh, article the same uh, number of the article and the um, constitutional court that uh, restored uh, the previous uh, article. So there was a, a, a problem in the application of uh, the norm of the law and we had to consider it in detail. The uh, Grand Chamber um, actually reversed the decision of the Cassation Administrative Court and uh, satisfied the complaint of the uh, of the complainant. And it uh, obligated the pension fund uh, to, uh, e to pay the function and to recalculate the function for the person who lived in the radiologically um, contaminated area. So uh, we have very limited time. Uh, just. I've got a question to ask of you. Do you believe that, uh, uh, what's your question again? Just if, uh, you, of course, it's very interesting uh, to uh, analyze every of the, um, every one of the 11 uh, pilot cases. We've um, had it for three years now. Do you think uh, it was a good idea to introduce this uh, institute at all? Uh, as far as I understand, this question was already uh, asked of Natalia Kovalenko, and I fully agree with her uh, in that uh, this is a novelty uh, in our legislation. The case law is in the making, and perhaps something should be improved, but I'm sure that uh, it uh, is a very good idea. It saves uh, the time, particularly uh, of uh, judges in the first instance, and it uh, helps us to uh, make a case law in uh, such repetitive cases, typical cases, uh, very consistent and uh, uniform. So, uh, um, and uh, experts are uh, most supportive of it, both in this country and abroad. Thank you very much for your question. I understand that we don't have any time to analyze all of the cases, but uh, we will have uh, these um, talking points or these articles uh, published. Uh, should you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Knazev. And again, I would like to remind you that 
all of your uh, presentations will be published in a special um, compendium of communications of this uh, conference and uh, you will be able to elaborate on your topic even further in those publications. One of the uh, most um, uh, actively discussed issues uh, in the Supreme Court in general, in the Grand Chamber in particular, uh, is the issue of the time frames within which uh, the uh, decision uh, needs to be uh, um, uh, adopted. Uh, we um, focused on that for quite a while, and our colleague Jan Berneziuk will comment on uh, uh, what we've come up with. Can you hear me? Good afternoon to all. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. It's a good occasion today. Our chamber worked for two years. We can make some conclusions. And speakers just already mentioned there is such, an, there is such a practice. We were first nine in numbers. Now we are 15 in number. And the, I would like to thank the organizers for this opportunity to report on the work we carried out. We have such an opinion that the most complicated issues relates to the terms, to the time span. No matter what we discuss, everything just whether it relates to the protection and what wording, formula wording we take the law. There is no single rule about that. Particularly, it is uh, cute about, about disputes related to the protection of social rights. In my presentation, I will give the indicate the figures. Just uh, one case considered by the Grand Chamber. The, the, the register shows that there are over 12,000 cases might be linked to this case considered by the grant 12,000 can be can be uh, orientated by that. So this might reach the stage of the Court of Appeals and even the Court of Accusation. Such an opinion that it is considered there are two, thin, uh, two things that are unavoidable. One of them is the tax payment. I understand that protection of social rights is a matter that cannot be unavoidable. So starting from the delivery of a child, when the young mother gives birth to the child and also when the person also retires. And the other thing is that there are no disputes, but the situation is worse when that uh, that the citizens need to prove that uh, the state violated uh, their rights. It's very sad that not all this, that uh, pension fund authorities understood that they made a mistake. It happens so that the pension fund understand it, that something was done erroneously due to different reasons, by the mistake of the legislation or the uh, mistakes by the executors, as we you are used to the service field of services. So that's uh, ask for excuses, compensate it and uh, depart it. As for the costs uh, for the legal aid, the situation is not just that would improve the level of confidence to the administrative justice, but uh, the issue of different. Now we'll talk about the temporal facets. Temporal uh, limits, there will be more reasonable name. The first slide relates to general matters that have already uh, covered by the previous speakers. Constitutional guarantees on what the social protection is based in Ukraine. The next slide. Thank you. 
Kenny Hayne'i In Ukraine, according to the new code, uh, Articles 222-223 regulate the terms during which uh, the person is to protect, to defend the rights. And of course, that means that the right is not to be defended in court after that. In cases we discuss, cases of social rights, uh, pension fund authorities state that all terms of applying to courts are defined are just aimed to uh, provide for the legal definition. But just if uh, the term of that case is over six months, then it is not resolved. We see with two subjects, they have their own truths about the legal definition. If the legal definition, the legal relations that are sustainable, then should not be. Um, other party says that if we talk about the old age pension, I was paying the contribution deductions, and I'm certain that uh, the authorities cannot do mistakes, cannot, cannot deprive me of my property, what I own what they owe me. In this dispute between two parties, which have their own uh, truths, it's difficult for courts to uh, choose a deposition. The problem is not resolved to the end. That is resolved partially in practice, but still this issue is considered by the Grand Chamber. Indeed, it's a complicated issue which required quite a detailed resolving to provide questions, answers to when uh, the terms are applied. So might be this a single time uh, uh, just a protest or given. The next slide. In this slide, information that other laws can establish different terms, different than six months. We'll pay attention that at least in three laws, there are special uh, terms relating to the protection of social rights. One position was stated that in 2018, we have a particular situation, Article 46 of the Law of Ukraine Compulsory State Pension, which clearly stated that, uh, that if uh, the non-paying of the old age pension was due to the fault of uh, the Pension Fund of Ukraine, all the amount should be paid irrespective when the such the person applied to courts most most legal relations where there are disputes don't have such particular provisions about that therefore the the pension fund uh, just uh, assures that six months the only period that the time that can be applied The individual may insist that the requirement relates to obtain, to receiving uh, funds and that is uh, protected uh, by Article 1 or Protocol 1, that there is legitimate expectation. So that cannot be legitimized uh, in a timely fashion. number of the case and the merits of the case which has been considered by the grand chamber 
That's case number 510-1286, and we expect that the Red Chamber will give, provide some uh, definition of that. To unblock of over 12,000 12, proceedings. So that's, that's an impressive quantity of cases and, uh, and they are not being resolved because of the absence of the certainty. What are the temporal limits? For? Then another note that recently the Grand Chamber resolved an issue of a similar character Uh, for example, on the restriction of the rights of old age pension for individuals that moved for uh, living abroad. And so the, it was, the idea was expressed that it might be deviation from the position of the Supreme Court, which considered that uh, so this the legal uh, this, uh, this should be applied to this and was not resumed because that that uh, individuals didn't apply for the resuming of paying uh, pension benefits in a timely fashion this is uh, what were the deviations made by the grand chamber Then in the presentation, we see also because of the shortage of time, briefly, the right to social protection is an alienable personal right, which cannot be restricted uh, without legitimate grounds. In legal relations, there should be the presumption of good faith of a person. I already said, if I paid social insurance contributions, then I expect when I am in the retirement age, the amount will be paid fully. Whether I am not entitled or not entitled, and in respect of the period, I, it has to be paid. And next, services provided by the pension protection should be of highest level because individuals expect from the state that my property was taken away from me in the form of taxes, give me back in the number of numerous uh, of numerous uh, benefits. So if pension benefits, uh, taxes might be incurred, and pension should be paid for the same period of, of uh, if it was not the fault of the, of the individuals. Question. I may reduce my uh, presentation. It is all covered in my presentation. Many things are repeated in here. To, re to, underline, to underscore, terms is a very difficult category. There are arguments on both sides based on the domestic law and the international law. We are facing the issue to resolve it. where is that boundary, temporal boundary in the protection of social rights. It's if the rights are infringed, for which period they are to be compensated. Uh, it's also the certainty for the pension fund as it has to plan its expenditures and also the 
work of the judiciary because it requires resources to, to process this. Thank you, Jan Alessandrovich. I just avail uh, myself this opportunity. I would like to point out that in May, last May, there was a webinar devoted to the topic of the terms. And there they analyze the issues mentioned by Jan Bernazuk in the development of the of the uh, unity just I would recommend to refer to the materials and I would like also to draw attention to other materials a very interesting project very interesting informative product I would like to thank Jan Alexandrovich Bernazuk webinar you were moderating you you organized that webinar right that's uh, there, there, there was there was a good effort to explain it should be taken into account we we are joined by mr vasil ilkov judge of the nipro petrovsk district so uh this judge says issues are met by many what are, what is the your vision of proving these cases Thank you very much. Good afternoon, uh, uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to still thank you for the opportunity to participate in this event. It's uh, become a good tradition to hold such conferences on certain global issues of administrative justice, uh, which are uh, most important. Uh, and uh, this is a wonderful initiative. Uh, it's a shame you had to reschedule it for um, September instead of July, but nonetheless, we are all here and we are discussing these issues. It is also great that the first instance court judges can participate and present their position and raise the issues with the in, uh, enforcement of law because we face most of those issues. With the preliminary analysis and uh, uh, surveying uh, my colleagues and uh, summarizing some of the information that we have in Dnipropetrovsk District Administrative Court, uh, we know that 40% of uh, our cases are about social disputes, which means that people uh, seek remedies or seek a redress of their violated social rights. That is, they have uh, come across a certain violation of their rights by public authorities. That, uh, and the um, percentage of these uh, large, uh, large share of those cases is about pensions. Uh, uh, so for uh, senior citizens, these are the most important issues in their life. And when we announced a um, uh, more closed or in chamber mode of uh, operation when uh, we had locked down, the retired people still came physically to uh, the courtroom to better protect their own uh, pension rights. That is why it is extremely important because administrative courts are thus implementing the uh, social functions of the state. Um, and uh, sometimes people said that uh, administrative courts actually serve the interests of the public authorities, which is not true at all. Administrative courts are here to protect the interests of the most vulnerable um, groups of the population. Now to the topic uh, of my today's uh, talk. And I understand that I will have to suppress it, to condense it. Uh, but I would like to underscore that uh, Article 77, Part uh, 3 of the Code of Administrative Procedure says that uh, a proof uh, or evidence uh, should be produced by the litigants, but the parties. And the court can only recommend that the parties collect evidence and present them to court uh, on their own initiative. 
So uh, we uh, suggest or we offer, of course, there are principles of uh, um, enshrined in Article 77 that if we do not do that, then we uh, can be um, accused of inactivity, but uh, the um, Honours of, uh, of uh, the uh, proof or burden of proof is on the parties. Thus, it helps uh, us to uh, be unbiased uh, and uh, protect the rights of the parties. In uh, our case law, uh, the first instance uh, courts face certain procedural issues of how to apply the code of administrative procedure, particularly its new uh, articles, including 262 and 263 of uh, this code. We all understand that uh, these uh, cases are not very complex cases. They are minor cases. Uh, once the uh, uh, amendments were introduced into the Constitution of Ukraine, uh, it became evident that uh, these cases never get to the cassation uh, instance courts, uh, which deprives uh, the complainants uh, part of their right to access to justice. And uh, here uh, I should single out this um, uh, institute of pilot proceedings or pilot ju uh, ju judgment proceedings, and it is a positive step. Um, uh, we, um, uh, in the first instance courts, uh, see that it helps us to consider similar cases uh, thanks to the case law of the Grand Chamber. And we apply uh, those recommendations uh, better on the ground. And I can tell you that the pilot cases actually contain a certain opinion. Uh, these are the uh, uh, judgments that have certain uh, normative power uh, and uh, become uh, uh, also part of the case law. But uh, we here in the first instance courts uh, remember that we should suspend our proceedings um, uh, while the, uh, the case is pending in uh, Grand Chamber and we have to restart it um, uh, or relaunch it once uh, the Grand Chamber takes uh, this decision. But uh, actually, we are very pressed for time. Uh, we should um, ask uh, our colleagues from uh, the Supreme Court to uh, publish their uh, result, uh, at least uh, the um, uh, judicial decree on the day that it is pronounced. Uh, no, and uh, the, uh, the uh, case uh, cannot uh, migrate from action proceedings to the summary uh, proceedings with the participation or that is oral hearing with the participation of the party. And if a court needs to call or to subpoena um, uh, witnesses, and sometimes it is the only uh, way of uh, hearing uh, the case on merits, because sometimes uh, it is about archives that have been destroyed, etc. So we have to rely on uh, the witness testimonies, and so we have to uh, uh, start a preparatory proceedings, and then we should close those preparatory proceedings, and then we should go to um, uh, to the oral hearing with the participation of the parties. So we see this need to improve. Uh, this procedure of transition from summary proceedings or written uh, proceedings without the participation of the parties to the summary uh, proceedings in oral hearings with the participation of the parties. And uh, thus we will have an opportunity to subpoena parties, uh, to subpoena uh, witnesses and to examine them. So this can be done uh, by amending Articles 12, 262, and 263 of the Code of Administrative Procedure. Uh, it would be uh, welcome if all of the uh, materials and presentations and uh, uh, reports uh, were sent to uh, the first instance courts, particularly administrative courts, uh, that would be very instrumental in improving our own uh, performance. Now, to save you time, I will be concluding here and I would like to thank particularly those colleagues 
uh, who uh, survived till the very end of this event uh, to listen to us. Thank you. And now I will give the floor to our colleague Natalia Kovalenko. Uh, and uh, the issue she is uh, going to raise uh, uh, is uh, has a bearing on the effectiveness of the protection of violated rights. But it is also a tool that uh, actually adds weight uh, to uh, the uh, judgments, particularly judgments of the Supreme Court. Do uh, court judgments actually play a preventive role is the question, or should we reinforce them uh, with uh, uh, some other tools to prevent violation of human rights, including social rights. And uh, thus, uh, most Natalia Kovalenko, uh, who moderated the previous session, will uh, actually uh, uh, digress on that. Uh, now, with, uh, without uh, any further ado, I'll go to the essence of my presentation of my talk. And perhaps you will be thinking that you, you've, you think that I'll be uh, speaking about uh, um, judicial oversight and uh, separate uh, determination or special determination for uh, failure to execute court decisions and uh, failure to submit uh, the oversight reports. But that's a, a, a different topic. Um, I, I need to focus on uh, on a special. Um, a determination uh, for the failure to um, execute the court decision. According to Article 382, uh, the court that uh, establishes certain judgment can uh, obligate the public authority who loses uh, to uh, submit uh, the report on the execution of this court decision. In uh, pilot cases that we've uh, been discussing so far, um, uh, the uh, Supreme Court uh, establishes this need uh, for the report, and it is a, a tool of uh, judicial oversight, and it has proven to be effective at the same time uh, surfacing some of the systemic issues uh, uh, with the oversight, with the judicial oversight. Um, where uh, is it effective? Where the uh, judicial uh, decree uh, actually um, has the instruction to the uh, public authorities to uh, commit certain action. But if uh, uh, it comes to uh, judicial oversight uh, in uh, terms of a recalculation of pensions, we do receive uh, reports, uh, particularly in pilot cases. Quite recently, we received such uh, a report, but uh, it contained information about uh, the uh, forming of a package of documents by the uh, pension for a fund institution and inclusion or uh, entering the uh, complainant into the special register. But the person still does not get the money. They are put on a waiting list. And uh, it seems like uh, the pension fund authorities or uh, officials have done whatever they can, but it's not the effective uh, uh, remedy. And the judiciary has no uh, levers uh, when the uh, budget is allocated for the execution of uh, those judgments. But we still need to protect rights and freedoms of individuals. Uh, since we are talking here not only with the uh, representatives of the pension, uh, pension uh, fund authorities or uh, bodies, but also the judges, uh, the judges should remember that if uh, the ECTHR judgment establishes facts that can uh, be uh, grounds for the disciplining of courts, then uh, uh, you will know the, uh, this at a, a, a judgment in case of Burmich and uh, and others versus Ukraine, particularly uh, now that we've got this infamous case, I would say, Burmich um, and uh, others uh, versus Ukraine. You all know it very well. The finding or the the finding or the, the uh, sanction of the pension uh, 
authority would not address the issue of uh, payment of the pension uh, per se, but we should remember that uh, when uh, we uh, actually uh, uh, award certain uh, sanctions or fines, uh, half of those uh, fines goes to uh, the uh, complainant. But the lack of funding, as uh, the Supreme Court uh, pointed several times, uh, uh, cannot be the ground for non or the reason for non uh, non execution of the court decisions. Otherwise, our protection will be just a, a delusion. Yes, uh, but you will uh, remember that uh, courts only enforce legislation, whereas it is the legislator that adopts laws. And we should uh, make uh, work uh, with the legislators to uh, encourage them to uh, not to adopt populist legislation. And uh, um, uh, Otherwise, uh, we will have extreme pressures on the um, state budget. And here you can see the um, uh, special uh, de um, determination in uh, the case according to uh, Article 249. And you can see the text on this slide. It provides for the following. When a court uh, establishes violation of law during the uh, court hearings, it can uh, uh, actually make spe uh, uh, special determination and send it to public authorities uh, uh, that um, uh, violated the law and it uh, in, if needed they can also uh, just I would not comment on part three but part, uh, uh, part two here is very important part two um, uh, opens up a procedural opportunity to um, improve interaction or cooperation between administrative courts and public authorities. There is a whole range of cases, and you know about that, whereby um, administrative courts would uh, revoke uh, decisions of executive authorities because of certain obvious procedural violations. And uh, these procedural violations are so obvious, they are glaring, um, uh, that they, uh, it, it becomes uh, evident that they were uh, done intentionally. Uh, for example, uh, inspection is um, appointed and conducted in such a way that uh, the court at a later stage would always repeal the outcomes or the findings of that, uh, of that uh, inspection because the procedure of the inspection was violated. Just uh, um, an example of uh, a special determination according to the previous article. Uh, it was uh, made by a uh, cassation administrative court. And this is not a, a social case, but I'm giving you, uh, it to you as an example of the entire uh, chain of uh, violated procedure or infringed procedure. And uh, 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 in this case, it is the State Service for Geology and Subsoil, but it can pertain to any other public institution or, uh, or authority, including those responsible for social um, protection or social welfare. Uh, so uh, the, uh, uh, there was an inspection uh, conducted by uh, the uh, but this institution and there were all of the possible violations. They sent a notification to a, an address uh, which was not the address of the uh, inspected uh, entity and uh, the uh, institution, the uh, uh, geolo geology and subsoil institution knew that it was the wrong, uh, the wrong address. So uh, uh, thus we established the facts of uh, unlawful uh, fulfillment of their uh, powers uh, um, of inspection. And inspection was conducted uh, w uh, in, co uh, in uh, um, violation of the requirements of the law. And uh, thus uh, the um, complainant uh, was deprived of all the uh, procedural uh, remedies 
schematically, uh, the essence of this special determination is like this. Uh, we establish the effect of uh, neglect of the official, uh, official duties. We establish reasons for uh, the violation. We uh, define the nature of this violation and we identify possible and factual implication and thus we make um, a special determination. Uh, over the last um, 30 months, uh, I would say, uh, we've uh, made several such uh, special determinations. Uh, they were not very numerous, uh, but uh, they are uh, a, a fairly effective tool. Uh, so I encourage you to uh, pay special attention to, um, uh, to these determinations, which are not uh, uh, um, uh, re responds uh, or they do not respond uh, to the um, non uh, execution of the court uh, decision, but rather the response to the um, offense, to the violation of the law. So uh, you can find these cases in the register of court decisions, and there was a, a special uh, determination against the uh, state tax inspection for failure to notify the uh, uh, judge uh, of the first instance in um, uh, court and court of appeal about certain uh, in data and failure to provide these data uh, to the uh, court, uh, particularly given that uh, the party had them uh, in their position. So this uh, determination would not be in favor of uh, the um, public authority, but it is just uh, that the uh, public uh, authority failed to submit uh, the evidence and the court had um, uh, not, um, did not know about the existence of those uh, cases. There's another case when a person uh, applied uh, to the uh, um, local self-government uh, body and uh, uh, that the Cassation Administrative Court made a special determination uh, to the national agency uh, to prevent corruption for possible in, uh, interest of the person uh, in uh, having the um, Cassation proceedings closed. Just the head of the district council that uh, was um, in theory to be uh, made accountable for uh, the misdeed uh, just um, uh, interfered with, uh, the, uh, with this um, determination. Uh, thank you very much. I suggest that you uh, resort to this uh, procedural tool uh, more often because they can have a positive impact on the operation of public authorities, uh, thus improving the protection of individuals. I believe that these are very uh, correct instruments in terms of improving the uh, trust and uh, to and confidence in uh, administrative courts. And thus, uh, the court should uh, resort to this tool more often, perhaps in a more effective way. And it is also an, an issue of uh, the interaction between the uh, courts and other participants of the processes. Uh, can these tools be used uh, uh, to the equal extent uh, by administrative courts, for example, and by civil courts? Because I believe that administrative justice is not just a type of justice, but it is a type of public consideration of cases of uh, trial uh, with uh, an in-depth purpose, uh, not only of uh, considering ca the case uh, inter partes, but also uh, the case that might have uh, effect uh, to other people, kind of uh, quote-unquote uh, erga omnis, uh, because uh, if it is a, a repetitive case and uh, the uh, case law is applicable in other cases, then it can be very effective means of protecting uh, human rights, particularly assist, uh, uh, social rights. And now I will give the floor to our colleague uh, Elnitsky. Uh, he's my colleague um, uh, from the university. Um, 
uh, Lviv uh, National Ivan Franko University, uh, and uh, he is also a member of uh, the advisory board of the Supreme Court. Uh, and I hope that uh, his uh, talk uh, will be useful to us and will be yet another incentive for you to co uh, continue cooperating. Thank with you, Vladimir Mikhailovich. In order not to uh, overtake the time, I would like to, 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 to know that in this situation, actually, uh, it's my honor to be in the panel of practitioners or judges. And my role is not quite ordinary for me. I would like to to return us to the theoretical 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 principles to which the conference is devoted and i had to generalize and on that my remarks will be perceived as a counter argument to what we are talking about but i i advise to listen to the end of my presentation and then to know what my presentation is ideas around so we've been talking a lot but actually social and economic rights are um, one of the elements of the general general uh, does about what is needed at the same time we should remember that the present day condition of the development of society just uh, uh, disables uh, the proper support of these rights Actually, the typical situation of the of the constitutional court that ensuring that the general society needs depends on the financial capacity of the state, no matter what we just think about that. Therefore, actually repeating the uh, just the statement made by Edith Seller, we just come to the conclusion that social economic rights being the positive uh, obligations the individuals are interested not in the law but as a value they are interested in the procedure of implementing their right this right without the mechanism of the implementation is um, this right without available mechanisms of their implementation without financial support of social rights of individuals it turns into the meaningless theme. We should understand it. There's a, a group of so-called negative, negative aspects. Speaking about financial safeguards of ensuring the social economic rights, we recall such a category as financial opportunities of the country. And it is not element of the Ukrainian know-how because Article 22 of the General Declaration Uh, speaking about the financial uh, opportunities, we speak about the priorities of uh, of uh, expenses over the expenditures, which is related with the so-called gold standard, the principle of balancing for providing for the social rights, which proportionally depends on the situation and how to organize revenues in this regard. Therefore, whether we want it or not, but the issue the issue of choosing between the right of an individual, the financial capabilities to see this animation. If this issue is not raised in the room where judges uh, confer but it then regularly appears in the and the, in the court hearings and then where the disputes are held we have heard the presentation of the representative of the pension fund of ukraine who actually corroborated this while researching the how to resolve this collision, I suggest to recall the words of Aaron Barok, who said the judge should think about the lawmaker, but not to think as the lawmaker. In this situation, I think that as any monad 
having two sides on the one side the question goes that the court doesn't evaluate the financial capabilities of the state we know that the uh, absence of the allocations from the budget cannot be the ground for non-complying with their responsibilities to the individuals but on the other side executive uh, branch of the government while the specifying is as the creativity which the courts do not have when make their decision. Well, just uh, just uh, this concept uh, returns that the constitution allow above the mechanism of accruing allowances by carrying out the decrease. But the European Court also said uh, that it, the state has a wide range how to see, achieve this balance between the rights and obligations, particularly by carrying out relevant economic policies. But talking about um, the freedom of discretion, we again just talk about the discretion, which was mentioned by Alec Pradewurs earlier. And to see the conclusion in my remarks, what is the boundary between uh, the trial? What should be the boundaries for the court to ensure the socio-economic rights properly? And just taking into account the discretion of the state. Having analyzed this, The, uh, as the online connection is just slow in responding uh, to the remarks of Oleg uh, Ilnitsky. The internet connection is not stable with Oleg. Can you hear us, Oleg? Mr. Oleg, can you hear us? And so there is a chance that we would hear something from you. Alec Vladimir, can you hear me? No, we hear you. Okay, continue, please. Thank you. The question goes about the rule of law as a principle of the general constitutional order. And now the other just about the legal character. What elements based from the uh, principles of the case law which I include into the rule of law and the legality. As for the rule of law, I speaking about non-absolute character of the right for the social protection, one should uh, um, just focus the attention that the intervention into them is allowed uh, till uh, this the content is uh, is uh, reflected. I would. Well, I could just uh, refer to the remarks of Mrs. Anishinko. That's the category of the human dignity. Any restriction cannot be, can be complied with this principle if uh, they, the, uh, if they just intervene into the dignity. It relates to the formal aspect, which provides for the sufficiency of the transition period for individuals to be able to adapt to the field of the socioeconomic rights if the law specified so. Of course, so a non-discriminatory nature of uh, norms. Uh, uh, it's interesting also to consider the issue of the lawfulness, that intervention should be made on the ground of the law to attain a legitimate objective and proportionally the intervention should be in proportion to the objective itself. The same way with regards, as was said by the moderator on the issue of the efficiency. To speak about lawfulness, we should analyze the lawfulness that after a judgment is made, whether there will be lawful order, how to resume the rights uh, with the with the, uh, with the attention, proper attention to the financial uh, capacity of the state. 
to resume rights, but indeed to create an efficient mechanism for its protection. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Oleg Vladimirovich. You are raising quite a complicated uh, set of questions. Very often there is collision between uh, real desired and possible. You raise these issues correctly, but standards of protection of human rights, they should not be, they should not be defined uh, first and foremost by financial financial ability so the state can balance through change in its uh, policy through change in its social services but it cannot promise benefit pain benefits and not to do that because there is a law which provides for this right and if this right is not as you can say, God said, then the strength of the law is lost. Then, actually, they, they do it generally. That, like, debtors do not have money, it doesn't mean that they cease to be debtors. You raise issues correctly, but still, we would like to have more practical, real tools, although with the difficult situation in this state, that the state should know how much money it possesses and to live according to, to it. So there are, there are many economic specialists, economists in the country who can calculate it. But I would like to thank you for raising this issue. We already did this question. We have also another topic which relates to, so, so one of the, say, gem in tools. And it relates judicial uh, monitoring. And the topic has been formulated. Larissa Tramefiomora said that I would like to know about uh, the judicial construct, but the topic is judicial view of good governance in social protection is. But, uh, so, Larissa Vitaliana, you have the floor. A judge of Cherkasy District Administrative Court. Uh, Власне, хотілося б зупинитися на одній цитаті із доповіді про стан людського розвитку за 2019 рік, де визначено, що Україна посіла 88-му позицію із 189 країн і територій, де рівень життя, що вимірюється валовим національним доходом на душу населення України, скоротився на 25,6% в період між 1990 і 18-ті роки. Дані дослідження вказують на занепокоєння громадськості щодо якості врядування, особливо через корупцію і нерівність перед законом. Е, можливо, така широка моя тема, вона буде покладатися в невеликий згусток слайдів і коротких тез, але вона перегукується із виступом е, шановного Олександра Віталійовича Петришина, який наголосив на важливості якісного виконання повноважень кожним, і його підтримала Тетяна Олександрівна Коломоєць, коли сказала, що важливим є чесноти чиновників. В контексті належного урядування і управління це стосується і тези Білої книги «Європейське врядування», де зроблено акцент на відповідальності національних адміністрацій та судів. І, власне, я би хотіла говорити про такий взаємозв'язок. Наступний слайд, будь ласка. Впровадження належного врядування. Сьогодні говорилося, Володимир Миколайович сказав про тези, і Олег Прудеус, пан, сказав про завдання адміністративного судочинства. 
І в цьому контексті завдання адміністративного судочинства хотілося б сказати, що захист від порушень суб'єктів владних повноважень, а через яскраву ловниткою ниткою через рішення судів касаційної інстанції проходить те, що адміністративні суди також захищають від свавілля влади. І саме цей захист, він вирішується судами як арбітром. І в даному контексті хотілося б сказати, що суд розглядається як інституція, яка вирішує, виконує функцію правосуддя і вирішує спори, але також одночасно виконує дуже багато інших функцій, послуг, як державна інституція і установа, коли надає інформацію, копії рішень і, ну, і інші виконує такі адміністративні послуги, зокрема. Коли ми говоримо про Верховний суд, коли зазначив, що дотримання принципу належного врядування оцінюється одночасно з додержанням принципу пропорційності, я би хотіла нагадати про те, що сказав на початку виступу Микола Васильович Оніщук, коли він сказав, що формується доктрина права застосування, але яка ґрунтується на засадничих принципах нашої Конституції. І, власне, на суди у взаємодії з органами влади, на які спрямовані на забезпечення виконання рішень у соціальних спорах, зокрема, покладається велика роль. Говорячи про помилки, які можуть бути виправлені в контексті реалізації принципу належного урядування, я би хотіла звернути увагу усіх на одну цікаву справу ЄСПЛ у, проти Болгарії за заявою 389814 риска 12, де стосувалося фінансування коштів фондом, потім звернення виплати з приводу цієї субсидії неотриманої. І от якраз суд відіграв важливу роль, коли він з'ясував усі фінансові можливості, зважив пропорційність і вирішив спір по суті. ЄСПЛ також зазначив, що відкриття провадження у справі було необхідним в зв'язку з істотними обставинами. Владі не варто заважати виправляти її ж помилки, навіть ті, які є наслідком недбалості, тому що в іншому випадку є загроза виникнення суперечності з доктриною несправедливого збагачення. Наступний слайд, будь ласка. Е, я думаю, що всім відомо, що контроль за владою поділяється на внутрішній і зовнішній. Е, про цей контроль можна говорити в горизонтальному і вертикальному вимірі. Наступний слайд, будь ласка. І ми будемо говорити про судовий контроль, цитуючи відомих вчених, в тезах буде посилання відповідно і в слайдах також. Коли ми говоримо, що судовий контроль спрямований на підтримання відповідальності державно-управлінських рішень, забезпечення захисту прав суб'єктів управлінських правовідносин, ліквідацію випадків зловживання службовим становищем і поновлення режиму законності. Наступний слайд, будь ласка. Власне, виступ Наталії Володимирівни Коваленко мені полегшує мою роль. І я, аналізуючи єдиний державний реєстр судових рішень, власне, по соціальним спорам в контексті окремих ухвал, стосовно статті 249, зустріла такі цікаві реагування. Орган субстрахування керується актами, які втратили чинність. Окрема ухвала суду не була розглянута міністерством, чим проявлена неповага до судового рішення. Рішення виконано формально, виконавцем не вжито заходів щодо роз'яснення працівникам застосування законодавства про сплату боргу і недоїмки. В такому контексті ваш, варто застерегти, що зараз дуже цікава є категорія спорів про списання ЄСВ і теж стосується темпоральних норм права. Встановити, притягнути до дисциплінарної відповідальності посадових осіб, які допустили невиконання рішення суду та інші питання, які реалізуються через інститут окремої ухвали. Наступний слайд. Окремі ухвали в контексті врядування можна говорити в контексті також вертикальної площини, 
вертикального вектору, коли стосується відправлення правосуддя. Є відповідні адреси і реагування, коли суд вищої інстанції реагує на позицію суду першої інстанції в контексті роз'єднання подивних вимог, в контексті неналежної організації контролю і таке інше. Тобто це дуже важливі аспекти, які стосуються саме врядування. І в цьому роль і відповідальність працівників суду, і апарату суду, і самих суддів під час відправлення правосуддя, реагуючи на прояви зловживань, є досить актуальними на сьогодні. Далі, будь ласка. Про незловживання права на ініціювання позовів щодо справ, за якими були вже ухвалені рішення. Верховний суд висловив цю позицію, але наразі я, як суддя першої інстанції, дуже багато зустрічаю випадків, коли все ж таки люди в контексті необізнаності не знають, що можна звернутися за таким інститутом судового контролю, як після ухвалення рішення. Звернутися про зміну способу виконання судового рішення, а продовжують ініціювати новий позов. Далі, будь ласка. Хотілося б звернути увагу присутніх, слухачів і учасників, що проєкт Конституційної комісії розробили відповідний розділ і пропонують закріпити статтю певну «Право на належне врядування в основному законі». Це ставлю до відома, що ми всі можемо долучитися до обговорення і удосконалення законодавства. Далі, будь ласка. Власне, тема суспільного інтересу сьогодні піднімалася у багатьма виступаючими, але я цю тезу хочу в контексті належного врядування приділити тому, що у нас ратифікована Україною конвенція про доступ до офіційних документів, яка набуде чинності з 1 грудня 2020 року. І там стосується не лише реалізації запитів на публічну інформацію, до судів теж надходить багато такої інформації, але воно стосується, власне, реалізацію принципів належного урядування. І в контексті поваги до гідності людини проявляється в багатоманітних відносинах влади, держави і людина. І коли ми говоримо, що право кожного на доступ до інформації, в цьому аспекті я би хотіла сказати, що важливим є ставлення до інформації і до знань. Варто зазначити, що... Є таке дослідження фінансової грамотності в Україні, коли було встановлено за методикою ОСР і показано, що Україна знаходиться на 30-му та, відповідно, на останньому місці у цих рейтингах. Результат України за індексом фінансової грамотності ОСР, знання, ставлення, поведінка становить 11,6 балів проти 13,2 бала, що є середнім показником фінансової. 30 країн, що складається з балів за фінансові знання. Тобто, в даному випадку, якщо звернути увагу на органи влади, на обізнаність, на популяризацію знань фінансових, які безперечно дотичні і до виступу попереднього доповідача, і до тих знань, які мають використовувати і працівники органів влади, і працівники, які реалізують бюджетне законодавство і беруть участь в усіх стадіях бюджетного процесу. І, зокрема, судді, які застосовують це законодавство, то поєднані із розумінням, що таке суспільний інтерес, коли інформація визнається суспільно необхідною, наскільки має бути вона оприлюдненою, у тому числі, коли мова йде про програмні засадничі документи, це має велике значення. Я думаю, що в такому контексті, на думку вчених, варто зважити. Далі, будь ласка. Ця позиція перегукується з обґрунтуванням напрямків соціальної і фінансової політики у контексті підвищення ефективності адміністративного судочинства в захисті соціально-економічних прав людини. Далі, будь ласка. І дуже швидко скажу про 
пленум ВАСУ від 29.09.2016 року про практику застосування судами про доступ до публічної інформації. Це в тому числі дотично до реалізації принцип належного, принципів належного врядування, але коли у нас варто звернути увагу на підзвітність і підконтрольній влади суспільству, на дієвий контроль за надходженням витрачальним публічних коштів, зокрема, і цільовим використанням цих коштів, і, зокрема, дотримання стадії бюджетного процесу і врахування такої важливої стадії, як виконання бюджету, де в тому числі відбуваються зміни, вносяться зміни, залежно від того, наскільки є дефіцит, профіцит і інші складові в бюджетних асигнуваннях. Далі, будь ласка. Це продов... Наступний слайд. Це продовження. Я вас, я вас попрошу, підсумуйте, будь ласка, основний ключовий меседж ваш. Основний ключовий меседж. Підвищення Дякую. ефективності судового Дякую. контролю. Дякую. Хотіла би сказати в тому, що судовий контроль настільки важливий не лише через застосування інституту окремих і про виконання судових рішень, а також і через е, такий інститут, як проведення наукових досліджень щодо стану виконання рішень суду і е, щодо впливу е, бюджетного планування на забезпечення виконання цих рішень для того, щоб люди роками не стояли в реєстрах, в чергах, і держава додатково не сплачувала пені, інші е, додаткові кошти. Разом з цим важливо, щоб законодавець звернув увагу на ці проблеми також. І крім того, в контексті ефективного врядування і ролі судового контролю, я думаю, що він має бути не лише внутрішній, але обов'язково і зовнішній. Коли е, знайомляться з опублікованими рішеннями судів, то в цьому аспекті е, варто зважати на ті зразкові справи і на позиції Великої Палати Верховного Суду щодо сформованих питань, але разом з тим і реагувати на ті болючі питання, які виникають у недоліках організації роботи, як судді, суду, так і відправлення функції правосуддя. Дякую. Зрозуміла ваша думка. Дуже вам дякую. Thank you for your presentation. Dear colleagues, dear friends, we are completing the work of the third thematic uh, section. There are some questions which have been put forward during registration. Wrapping up what we have been listening, already some answers were provided, but we also Тому я як модератор дозволю собі Thank you very much, dear participants. Uh, this is the time for us to uh, call it a day uh, and uh, sharing my impressions uh, with you. I would uh, rather uh, endorse uh, what uh, the previous speaker has said. Uh, it was a very useful uh, event. All of the uh, presentations were uh, very um, practically applicable and I am sure that it will improve the way we administer justice and thus it will enhance uh, confidence in uh, administrative uh, justice. Some of the um, uh, presentations were particularly topical uh, because they addressed the issues that are still outstanding, uh, the issues that uh, uh, do not yet um, have uh, reasonable solutions or some uh, effective solutions and uh, we will be working to uh, look for such solutions and it is about um, uh, 
compensation of damage, about the application of the European Social Charter. It is about treating IDPs and ensuring that they uh, are treated fairly and equally. It's about tre uh, in the treatment of uh, people in their appointment and occupation. It's about international best practices of uh, applying uh, law in administrative justice. And uh, I can assure you that uh, we will continue uh, this work of uh, mutual exchange, mutual enrichment. We want to improve, we want to change, to live up to the best European standards. Uh, as you might know already, communications of this event, uh, event will be published. We will have a compendium of our legal positions and we will also have um, a result of the provider with the recording of uh, this uh, conference, including questions and answers that were um, either vented or implied in uh, the presentations and in the chat conversations. It is not uh, the very end of uh, uh, this um, uh, web, uh, 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 webinar. And we leave that uh, we will now launch a whole series of webinars uh, for the next uh, two or three months. I hope that you will be equally interested and uh, active in registering for those um, for those events. I would like to uh, specifically thank our partners, uh, that's the um, EU project uh, Bravo Justice, it's the COE uh, project of uh, internal displacement long-term solutions and another project, development of social uh, rights of the persons as a factor of sustainable democracy in Ukraine, it's also uh, OEC um, uh, PCU, it's the uh, uh, German Fund of uh, Legal Cooperation, it's the uh, School, National School of Judge, uh, Judges, it's the uh, Institute of Law uh, named after Koretsky. Thank you very much to all of those partners. I would also like to thank uh, our international uh, uh, colleagues, uh, Edith Seller, uh, Eva Wendler, uh, Ms. Yautrice Brieda from Latvia, uh, our German colleague, Ma uh, Marianne uh, Messner, and our Polish colleagues, uh, Monika Smuskulesha, and um, our long-standing friend, Mr. Bartosz Wojciechowski, also from Poland. A special thanks go to the interpreters who uh, helped us to uh, talk and uh, we would also like to thank the sign language interpreters and the um, provider digital events for high quality communication channel that enabled this event. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy and meet you again, I hope in person.